Um, thanks so much to Shantan. Thanks so much to everyone who's joined the. Uh, this is our third, third edition, fourth edition, fourth edition of uh, Art Design and Conversation. Um, this is part of a series, an outreach series that we have for our studio, Bhubaneswar Experimental Art and Design Studio, which is a dream that uh, Jagannath, uh, myself, and a few others had dreamed of uh, in 2014, and uh, we're lucky that we managed to bring it alive. And uh, it's uh, it's a space for uh, designers, for artisans, and uh, uh, for uh, uh, people of uh, of the ill to join together and do something interesting. So we are a design studio based out of nature that makes environmentally friendly, ethically inspired and elegant products. And we believe in the power of art and design to change and improve people's lives. And we believe that Orissa's creative spirit has a lot to offer in this space. And that's what we've been doing. And if you ask me how we're doing it, uh, there's a lot of learning. It starts with a lot of learning and uh, learning not only about the spaces we inhabit, learning not only about the people uh, we are working with, the, their inspirations, but also learning from people uh, who have done this, not only in our state, but in different parts of the world. And uh, we are lucky that today we are in the presence of uh, one such person. I mean, Sainthan is uh, the enemy of uh, a lot of these experimental and interesting works that uh, uh, that you will get to see as a part of today's conversation. And today's conversation is precisely that ADC art, art design and conversation, which is uh, which is like we talk with Sivanand, who is interestingly Sainthan's uh, um, alma mater from his previous college, and so. Today we have a chance to talk to Sainthan and uh, talk about his experiences and his explorations in the field of design, art, public art, for which he's really famous. And uh, I mean, I'll I'll br say a few words about Sainthan's biography and all of that. But uh, I I just want to start off by saying that I met Sainthan during the publisher art trail. Some of us here know that, and uh, uh, he was uh, he came in in a very unusual role because was the very first time that we were trying to do a public art project in Bhubaneswar where we wanted to do a very distinctive scenography that covered the trail and made it distinctive as a festival location without uh, uh, without anyone missing out the fact that you know they were in a very special uh, place where public art was displayed and using just bamboo and uh, wool and pieces of uh, uh, paper like he constructed something that was truly and utterly amazing to the point that when we had, I mean, we were just talking about it, the point that we were having the inauguration, the CM was like, This we should have it for the Hockey World Cup. But he ended up doing it for the Hockey World Cup. But um, the entire journey was, uh, was a journey of passion, and there was a lot of people involved, and he was so passionate with the whole thing. I was truly privileged to uh, see him work. And if I want to read up a little bit about his background, born in Calcutta, an architect by qualification. Um, he's a graduate from the School of Planning and Architecture, New Delhi. Uh, and his, um, his speciality is explored in the realm of public art and doing site-specific interventions uh, with the Layout Collective. He's a chief coordinator of the NGO Shelter Promotion Council, through which he has curated and produced public art festivals in Sikkim, Nagaland, Meghalaya, and West Bengal as the first of its kind, which comprises a melange of new media art and contemporary art that addresses socio political and environmental nature. So, you'll hear a lot about this whole Northeast journey of his and in some of his faith work that he's done in the Bangladesh border. But this is the point at which uh, I kind of shut up and let uh, Shainton say a few words before I jump into the questions. Shainton, over to you. How are you feeling about this? And uh, thank you so much for uh, joining this conversation. Yeah, thanks a lot, Beads, for inviting me. It's a privilege. And uh, also a lot of my old friends whom I met during Bhuvaneswar Art Kela here. I'm very happy that we're reconnecting through this conversation. So uh, I will uh, basically today go through my journey of like uh, 
like a decade or whatever like 10 years or more and uh, i i hope this is a interesting interactive sessions hello we get things yeah uh, yeah yeah absolutely enjoy that i'll ask a few questions in yeah the uh, like i just start off with one that's the word that 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 comes to my mind very often like you were educated as an architect right and you should be out there making big skyscrapers and buildings and office spaces and things like that but now we know you as a scenographer we know you as a curator we know you as a public art activist how did this move happen let's can we get a view into that yeah uh, very uh, very important question i mean i don't get to uh or get this direct question very often but uh uh see i i kind of uh, when i started doing uh, uh being in the architecture school i kind of got disillusioned that we are building very selfishly you know you are designing a building and you have a boundary so you are only building for yourself or for your client so it's it's one of its kind and you're not uh, looking at your environment looking at your site or what is beyond your site so there were some things which were bothering me in school and this is why what i felt was missing in even the premier architecture school in india which was spa and one of the premier institutes so right. so during my school days i i i, I trained uh, like in fourth year where you have to go and train under an architect i decided to do a film instead because okay. i felt the solution i didn't want to work under an architect and you know go there but yeah this could be <laughs> problematic these things for lots of people but that was me and uh, so after i uh, i got out of school the architecture school uh, a couple of like minded friends who were also disillusioned they started to wave we started a office a uh, architectural office right yeah. so strategically this office we got or accidentally i call it was right bang opposite coj new delhi so coj okay. is the epitome of contemporary art scene in india it yeah. built the base for contemporary art scene in india and so for the next couple of years we were just lying in coj so our, our yeah. extended office was coj we were always just to hang out there and we started making these friends who were from this different world not into architecture but they were into this so called art realm and every every kind of experiment was happening in coj that time so i'm talking of yeah teens Uh, just the uh, early 2000 onwards so that was like a phenomenal time where every artist you know who's famous now uh, yeah. had to do something with codes that time and so many international artists turned up so our vision changed and luckily a uh, coach director and uh, one of the main person from coach was puja sud she kind yeah. of got hold of us and thought that these three boys they are not doing anything so they should start working with coach in certain ways so we did a small uh, refurbishment of coach that time with okay. our ideas as architects and then we started to work with her for uh, the first new media uh, uh new media uh, art uh, gallery or museum per se right. first one right. in india where all the new media would be coming and working this was uh, the apj new media gallery which happened in faridabad so right it was this two warehouses that we were at liberty thanks to puja who explored there with spaces with videos we learned a lot of interactive design and art the first of its kind that this was when video art came to india you know like yeah we had the chance to work with many international curators so uh, after this journey uh, you know life changed for me at least and uh, i decided that i will stick more to it I, i like i started liking this conversation liking this conversation with the artist because the artist confided in you as a designer i like started working as a designer so whenever the artist wanted to create something big something interesting they we have would have a conversation so so that is how i started making lots of friends who were now very famous they yeah. big international artist at that time doing cutting edge work and that's what i'm saying cutting yeah. edge because we started doing practice which was unheard of at that time yeah, yeah. so uh, so this is how the journey started and uh, then slowly i started working for various uh, private museums in 
Delhi and surroundings. I did it for actually 10 years after that, after school. So yeah. uh, during this time again, when I started working for these uh, contemporary art galleries, a lot of work was happening, a lot of investment was happening in art. But what I felt was very few people would turn up for these multi career projects. Right. So we are creating with so much passion, so much this thing in the so called white cube museums. Right. The number of people coming in are very less, and they are all from the same you know, fraternity at certain level. Right. This kind of started questioning me into, uh, into thinking is art only for the rich and famous who could afford to walk into, dare to walk into a, that glass door. Yeah. So these were questions which started bothering me, and uh, that's how, uh, as as a designer, as a, as a as a person who was working with so many curators, uh, it started bothering me, you know. And right. this is where uh, I was looking into something else. So, so it's a combination. It's a combination of your rebellious spirit and the presence of coach that took you in a very different direction from what normally an architect would end up doing which is like doing an internship learning from a master and then you know designing office spaces and things like that did that bother you that you never ever did anything of the sort or by that time you were truly and properly bitten by the artistic and uh you know the cutting edge work that you were seeing the bug why had you been properly bitten by that no i was i was happy uh, being friends with my other artist friend i was not doing art myself so yeah. i was in a very different spot i was watching so i was like almost like a person who was watching live on the wall so yeah. so but but i was also having this conversation with artists so that was very interesting so uh the artist confiding in me itself was a very interesting uh, space you know i, I receive which not a lot of people will not get into you know like normally artists do not share their things with everyone it's not possible. yeah yeah i got into a zone which was very safe zone you know like very safe zone and that was a very i was very fortunate for that you know they recognized the kindred spirit that uh that like we all yeah. we all do so you spent time in delhi you were working with coach you spent some time with the galleries also there where you were kind of working on different projects where at what time did your focus shift towards northeast like how did huh. northeast happen yeah the northeast was this dream space where uh uh, or, or this shadow zone of India, as we call it. So, luckily, being in School of Planning and Architecture, we got exposed to students from everywhere in India, also from yeah. Bhutan, Nepal, uh, Myanmar, many other countries. So, we are very lucky. Yeah. In a very small school, very few students, but we were completely, uh, you know, demarcated or, or basically represented from every part of the country. Now that is something which is very interesting and that is where also you started learning and when you were staying in the hostel, like I come from Calcutta, uh, yeah. going to Delhi is a completely different experience as just after school, my uh, school and then uh, you meet all these people from everywhere who speaks in different languages, they dress up differently, yeah. they look different. Now this, this really changed so many perceptions in my personal life because I've only seen Bengalis around me or Tensa yeah. is before that in my life. Yeah. So that completely changed. And then uh, you know, we used to play so sort of football together. So I you know like uh, people from Northeast do and uh, all the yeah. things. So slowly uh, we became very thick friends with a lot of my Northeast uh, friends. And in 2006, uh, which is much later, uh, we did a biking trip for around 40, 50 days all over right. the northeast which started from uh, we started from Assam and then we went to Mizoram, went to Manipur and then went back to Nagaland Nagaland to Arunachal east of Arunachal yes. and then back so it was like those days these kind of trips never happened I mean yeah. the so called bullet things happen now but we, we talked about 2006 so early days pioneers same yeah so like three bikes and six people six friends that is when I got to see Northeast and when, when we say Northeast we always mean or when we talk about the state for instance mostly yeah. if I talk about Orissa I'll invariably go to Vonesso or Orbori and think yeah. that this is Orissa but that's not yeah. the truth right so it's a true. huge state so this biking trip 
completely change our perception of hope in your eyes. Absolutely. We saw both. We saw the rural, we saw the urban, we saw what was happening there that time, the transformations, the army, everyone was present that time. The politics. Yeah. Yeah. So the Meghalaya people, our friends from Meghalaya, their parents would tell us do not go to Nagaland at that time. Right. Right. Because there could be an issue. So but we still went because we were very this thing, you know, like we negated things and we were like <laughs> so uh, what happened was we saw things which which were very different and very personal in our journey. We've seen the entire hills getting burnt in Chum. We were biking right. past we were like a like a living dead body or kind of thing. But just imagine yeah. a hill, entire hill which is yeah, burning and that's home cultivation happening, right? Basically so, shifting cultivation. So these are, yeah, shifting so these are things we went through and we went to several borders, roads. We traveled through spaces where, you know, like for six, seven hours, at least three hours, there's no dhawa. No right. concept of dhawa. We traveled for hours and no car would pass you back by. Right. So these are these are roads we traveled that time. So this completely, you know, got me into Northeast. And then right. I started doing these personal journeys, travelings into Northeast. So yeah. That's that's how I started thinking about Northeast and my friends there. Right. And how did this translate into your artistic interventions that like at what point of time did it shift? I mean you can share some of your Yeah, I will I mean I've seen them, but uh, yeah, I will love stop Northeast. sharing now. So yeah. If you allow me, yeah. Please. Or do I have to give you permission? Or is it there? No, I don't, don't think so. I think I can go for it, yeah. There you go, brilliant. Yeah. So uh, basically, as we all know, Northeast is uh, Northeast of India, consisting of eight states, if you consider Sikkim also, uh, is on the eastern side of Bangladesh. Uh, can you hear me? Can you see my screen? I can. I hope the rest of the guys can. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Yes, yes. Okay. So, uh, so uh, this is basically uh northeast of india and uh i quickly go straight to the first festival so yeah. uh sandeep asked me this question of how i got in there as i said this this working with various gal with various museums and gallery spaces i was feeling this idea of why are people not coming in so i intervened into a space not like calcutta but i wanted to intervene into a space where there is no gallery space. So for me, okay. it was more like going to a space. I would do my personal first public art journey into a space where there's nothing, where there's no uh, galleries, no museums. Of course, there are museums, but these museums are of different kinds. So uh, I started my first leg of journey from this festival called Blooming Arts, Blooming Sikkim Public Art Festival. Uh, right. And this happened in 2011, but for one year, and I did another trip, another biking trip from Calcutta to all the way up north into Sikkim with two of my friends. And this time, uh, I was traveling into Sikkim. And this okay. uh, also, when we were traveling and we, we, we had a lot of time, so it was not like a very quick trip or anything. So we spent a lot of time with my friends in Sikkim who are essentially mostly architects. And that right. is the time I decided, this is 2010 I'm talking about. And I decided that for the next one year, I'm going to keep coming back here again and again mm -hmm. and start uh, becoming friends with the filmmakers, artists there. And uh, I tried to look into a public space, like the main street is called uh, MG Mart. Yeah. Mart Malandi Mart, which is like, you know, it's like everywhere. <laughs> yes, like everywhere. But this is like a mall road. So it's like not to walk through that small portion of that road. So yeah. in, in all of Sikkim, this is basically the heart of Sikkim, which is like a road, but uh, traffic is not allowed there. So right. that's why this stretch of road becomes like a public space, massive public space and hotels are on both sides. There's plenty of shops. People hang out there. So pedestrian I, friendly. Yes, very yeah, pedestrian friendly space. Yeah. So I invited a lot of my friends, uh, again, as I'm saying friends, but uh, the first work you saw was Pro Helvetia, uh, 
when I in like by I pushed uh, I went to Provencia. They said, okay, we are going to send you two artists to Sikkim and let's see whether we can work this out. So this couple called Karin Verchi and Guido, uh, they were Shali Five, and they yeah, came here. Yeah. These are the Swiss Swiss artists, and they travel all over the world and they make these kind of symbols all over the world, and they they make it in different forms. But here they were basically uh, completely transformed. Uh, they were right. shocked and and quite uh, uh, revered by the idea of a Himalayan kuli. How they can carry so much weight. So we made these extremely light structures, and right. they were floating like this, uh, like this cloud all over. Uh, the, see, there's this, the lot of top. Yeah, so it yeah. looked like a beautiful moving installation, and uh, uh, so they called it the white space shifting. And all the people who are coming in between these white uh, backdrop, they yeah. were photographed, and that was their work, which they carried forward to their journey. Oh, and, nice. Uh, now, why, why, when I was talking there, so I was talking with many architects there, we wanted to know what was the issue which they were facing in life in, in a place like Gantok specifically, because we were doing this in Gantok. So one very interesting topic, which I could not deal with actually, and that's, that's what I'm saying, it's, I could not deal with, uh, which uh, they, they, they had a major problem at that time, I'm talking of 2010, 2011. So the highest suicide rates in the country was in second at that oh. time and and people the young people were committing suicide the highest rate there so i asked is it because of poverty is it because of something else is it, they, they had no reason for it so they right. could not be actually identified as, as this is the reason for that and uh, so uh, i was talking to uh, this artist friend of mine and uh, you know called sana Baji. of course this work always became a uh, un unbuilt work, but he gave a very nice suggestion. He said, okay, let's, uh, when I was discussing with him, uh, and of course this work never happened, so this, some works always leave us ideas, right? So yeah, work, he was going, let's work. And Sanad Banerjee, you know, he's this great graphic novelist, the first one in, in, in many sorts here in India. So he said, okay, let's do a, a series of banners, like massive banners all over uh, Gang Talk, which say, right. let, let's do uh, the art of failed suicides. So how you can create a kind of humor, but very healthy humor or, uh, or even something as, as complicated as suicide. So he was looking forward uh, to what, how, how you fail to commit a suicide. So how you, can, how you fail to commit a suicide. Yes, yes, you tried committing suicide, but you could not. So taking that, that as a cue, but to create a kind of a laughter, to create a dialogue, it's all about creating a dialogue. But how do you deal with as complicated thing like the suicide, not works? Right. So this is what we were trying to do. This this never happened, as I'm saying. But uh, always I remember this story about about how we were having this conversation. So right. the next work you see is a is a work which uh, this is illusion in motion, which I'm also part of. So G2 and Thomas. Thomas is a German. Uh, the inter interactive designer. So there was this hotel, not hotel, this is a star theater, it used to be a theater. But after that, it was like this property which was not getting used. So, right. so this was 2010 and that is when we started doing 3D mapping work. Right. So this was treated like ghosts. So ghosts are coming out of this building. And right. you could suddenly see that some things are popping out, creeping, crawlies are coming out and stuff. So, I'm trying to really expand it, make it bigger, so we can see the whole thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, this yeah. is our okay. kind of window. Yeah. And if yeah, you yeah. see, this is 3D mapping work in 2010. That is still when 3D mapping was not there in the country. Interesting. And Thomas was our collaborator and he came and, you know, he created this. So we were having fun also. The idea of art for us was to engage with the audience, to create questions. So they were also creating this question because this building was about to get demolished soon. Right. So we were questioning, you know, why why is it getting demolished? Why is property in ruins and things like that? Right. Uh, the next work is a beautiful work, and this was a stunner. Even Delhi uh, a journalist in Delhi would normally never sh uh, talk about sure. it. Came as a space, and there's no news information in Delhi newspapers. I mean. Uh, national newspaper yeah. uh, got this photographed and with 
This work is by the local artist called Karma Tendra and Karma and uh, basically told us he, there's a lot of drinking driving happening was mm. at that time in, in Sikkim. So he wanted to get all these crushed cars which had fallen down the cliffs to actually get those real original cars, get them up and put in every traffic station. Of course, okay. he not managed so many. So this work was called The Art of Driving. And uh, nice. this work never needed any explanation. So we plunged this work straight in front of the tourism department there. And this was a stunner. You can see so many people coming in. And this is basically uh, monochrome colored red. So yeah. this car was completely like newly painted. But yeah. the form was a broken car. And no one needed an explanation for this. Everyone understood. So some work had that power of, of conversation. But this is that site site specific and drawing from local yeah uh, yeah uh, uh, backgrounds that you can I mean with the yeah. color red yeah it's brilliant yeah yeah red and is a mini would have red is a very uh, very uh, uh, I mean it's also very much used in Sikkim every form right. this is a work by uh, a Bangladeshi artist called Mabubur Rahman and uh, this work was basically we made a huge head made of orchids from Sikkim and cowbells. So okay. when there was wind and there's always wind and very nice breeze, mm -hmm. uh, these bells would have a lovely sound, cowbells. And, mm -hmm. and the idea was there's an oxygen mask on your head, head. On that on that on that head, which is basically yeah. plants. Yeah. So even if, if the idea was in the future maybe even plants might need an oxygen mask. Yeah. yeah. So, so this is what the work was. Unfortunately, I could not get the artist inside, and this is why I did a later project called No Man's Land, which I'll get there later. Yeah. So, uh, as so you couldn't get the you couldn't get the artist inside. I or, could not get the artist inside. Or the color. Mm -hmm. No, uh, the artist. Artist came. The artist came because he flew all the way from Dhaka to Calcutta, Calcutta to Bagdogra, and from Bagdogra you have to take a car to come to Gangtok. In okay. that process you have to cross a place called Rangpo which is basically an entry point to Sikkim and there you have That's to show true. your ID card and he showed his passport and he was never allowed inside oh. but we had already been got a visa from the Indian government so okay. it was a mistake so I got to know that India uh, basically Sikkim got uh, became a Sikkim was a kingdom till 1975 yeah. and it became part of India and the rules were that People from China, uh, Bangladesh, Myanmar, uh, and two more Pakistan, and one more country, uh, Nigeria. So they cannot no. enter enter uh, this thing. But this even the Sikkimese didn't know, and neither did I. And the okay. Indian government had given him a visa. So, and then they stopped him because it was a restricted area. So he never got in. He was stuck in this border of Rangpo, which was 30 kilometers, 40 kilometers from Gangtok. And every right. day I go back there, met him. And this is where I conceived this next project of mine called No Man's Land. Right. And uh, this took me four years to conceive. I'll come back, come there later. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's where we decided, to, you know, we will cross a border one day without a visa and passport. So No Man's Land is all about that. It took me four years of permission from Indian government and BSF, RAW, yeah. and over there later. So this is a beautiful work. Uh, again, coming back to Blooming Sikkim, this work is a duo called Review, Srijata and Mrityanjas, and they are basically they work with participatory art or a community based okay. art. Mm -hmm. And this, what they did was in Sikkim, whenever anyone goes, they do this five pointer. This is a standard strategy. You know, I will go visit. I, I'm there in Sikkim for one day. I will visit these ten spots. Right. So I'm done. I'll visit the seven spots. I'm done. So they said, no, let's uh, let's not do that. Let's also uh, make the visitor take back a little bit of Sikkim with him. So right. what they did was they made this uh, sculpture, let's say this this painting, and this sound booth. They collected locally made songs, poems uh, from local okay. people, not big artists. Right. This was playing in the sound booth and this became a very relaxing zone so people would hang out there, just say chill and then they go. Yeah. So basically taking out a little bit of 
seeking a way after you go and not just being complete tourist there. So from there here, I got a chance, I got an invite to, to some people came, a lot of people got to see this work in Northeast and then they invited me to work for the next year's Hornbill Public Hornbill Festival. So I had the opportunity to work on a much bigger project now, uh, yeah. on a much more adventurous work, which uh, which is basically, which became part of the Hornbill, Hornbill Festival, which is the biggest festival of not uh, of, of as the Netherlands where there's the biggest. Yeah. So there's so yeah. many, there's amazing Hornbill uh, festival is a uh, have to see kind of a Must festival. Yeah. yeah. So what I introduced, and it only happened for once, uh, basically, where I did a Hornbill Public Art Festival. For those 10 days of Hornbill, I did a public art, uh, public art uh, festival where I invited 20 artists, from some other artists and artists from India and also Switzerland to come and uh, work uh, on a 20 kilometer stretch. Now, it's okay. highly ambitious, <laughs> highly ambitious because Hornbill Festival happens in this uh, capital city called Kohima and yeah. Kohima, one end of Kohima is a stadium where the rock show used to happen that time, which was uh, the one end of uh, where you see number one written and from right. um, Kohima, you have to go around 13-14 kilometers away and you have this, uh, this village, this model village they have made called Isama and right. where is where uh, they have tribal representation from all over Nagaland. So essentially right. Nagaland have 16 tribes now and mm-hmm. all their huts, different kinds of architectural huts, it, all, all the, all the uh, tribes have different forms of architecture as well, besides different forms of sculptures and all that. So Nagas, uh, the, the idea of Hornwell Festival is all, to get all these tribes together because all Naga tribes were in seclusion, not even yeah. 100 years back. So a village used to fight with the next village. Yeah. So the village was considered as a country by themselves, right? So right. one village was one country and they would fight with the next village because that was another country. So Hornbill Festival, what it did to them was also to get all the Naga tribes to together. Yeah. yeah. So this is where we thought again that this is a beautiful space where we can work on. So. Uh, this first work, which you've seen, is many did a work called uh, archaeological retrieving because uh, the Nagas, who were essentially tribes and they were animistic, uh, they followed animistic religion. Uh, around 150 years back, 100 years back, uh, American missionaries came all over Northeast and they converted them into Christians. They shamed them. They shamed their tribes and. So basically right. their culture was kind of gone and gone in such a bad way that you know the largest collection of Naga artifacts is right. this place called Petrie Rivers Museum in Oxford. So if you have to see any original authentic Naga work of the past, you have to go to Petrie Rivers Museum or go to Switzerland or go to America. Now this right. is very painful because what we see uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, I mean uh, Nagaland right now, where there's a Nagaland museum. So this is not enough, you know. So yeah. as, 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 as a, as a, most of the things are gone. Yeah, the, most of the things are gone. And most of the original things are gone. Original. The rest are made with the fakes. And also, yeah. Nagas had a beautiful uh, idea at once that after you die, after Naga died, and this is the case for it, most of the tribes, the, the body, with the body, Whatever he has used from his childhood till his death was given to him because he has to go to his next life. For the right. next life, you have to carry those things with him. So they right. became the Naga burial grounds or when Nagas were dead, uh, you know, they became these living museums. Museums are kind of rot. Yeah. yeah, living museums, but they will rot in the in the, in, the, in the open, right? right. So, so this is how no other traditional uh, artifacts could be saved, right? right? Because they were also taboos to give uh, or they, they could be seen as omens for the family, it could be in luck for them. So mm-hmm. you don't find Naga artwork. Now you find a lot of replicas, a lot of these things. So this was the space where we were uh, working on. And uh, uh, the next, uh, the first work was basically based on this. And what we did was this artist called Dipawan Kaur, he plumped a, a kind of 
some sculptures inside the ground and buried them and then dig them up. So he was making fake archaeological retrievings. Yeah. Right. So he, are, he behaved like a fake archaeologist here. Right. So he, he, this is the kind of work he does. So he kind of reinvents history in a way. Uh, so the next work on your right hand side, you see uh, uh, is a video mapping work where you see these two smileys. I try to fake broaden it up. It's basically a searchlight. Yeah, and there's one smiley which comes out of the window. It's like a shadow, and they're watching him. So it, it talks about the army. It talks about surveillance. Yeah, of that kind. Uh, on the right hand side is a work by Gigi Stalin. Yeah, Gigi is a very famous artist. I love his work. His work on urbanism. So this was my take on how these newer cities of the country or towns become city. How they are so unplanned and so how they grow so unplanningly. So uh, these were beautiful towns in the past, but now there's urban growth. I mean, random growth everywhere, and that spoils right. the you not know, texture and and the, and the and the essence of the city. You know, mm -hmm. so so these unwanted buildings which happens. Uh, this is a this is a work. This on the work you see Sunshine Ghosh's work. Very interesting work. So this was placed in the stadium, and this was called Alder Shelter. And this work had a bass guitar and a and a, a lead guitar. So when both the people, about both two people who are there, would come and play it, this light work works in inclusion. Oh, okay. So it's an interactive light the interaction work, and this also talked about the history and and many other things. But they have to play. Both the guitars have to play. They have to play. Okay. Yeah, just to have this work work. On the right hand side is a very interesting work. Again, it's uh, it, this we see this wall, and this wall has some sensors, and these sensors, if you walk past that, uh, if you walk up to this staircase, they will call you. So basically, there's sensors which calls you, and okay. then if you put your ear on that wall, you hear older Naga people talking about their oral history. Okay. So. This was a very interesting work, also, uh, and uh, yeah. So there's many works which which happen. Yeah, I tried them interesting. So yeah. Lumi, yeah. Sikkim, and uh, and On Bell, uh, and obviously there have been other uh, um, festivals to be part of. How was your reception by the people? Because yeah, there's always the fear of the outsider. There's always yeah. this. Yeah. What does he know about our cultures? He's just traveled and he knows a few yeah. people. But how did they receive you? What was your yeah? This is a, this is the most important part of why this conversation started. Why I wanted to engage. So uh, as I'm telling you, uh, we have one set of people who are always looking at work inside a gallery space. So yeah. a lot of other people do not. They shy away from seeing this. But once we are putting this work in public spaces, sometimes you accidentally encounter these works, and you right. start having these questions. You might start having this question. So we also had many volunteers, uh, you know, locals yeah. who were there, who were kind of given the kind of a very basic thread. But we also shied away from talking too much uh, to explain the work in detail. Uh, it is always a very chance encounter, and how you like it. So many, many right. years uh, later, you uh, get to hear them. You know, Kesa uh, Wata. So this work right now I'm just showing is is work by Shushanta Mandar. This work was in the middle of Kohima city, and you see this this is a magnifying glass, and the back there are some images, some photographs, and this right. magnifying glass keeps on moving. So right. this work was about someone's backyard and all that. So you walk in yeah. and exactly see something in detail. So he made this work as as a as an outsider. So okay. from the lens perspective of an outsider, the work by uh, that in that case, this is a work again by review. The ones who did that sound booth in uh, uh, Sikkim. Yeah. See, this is a this is a telescope, right? So these are these Naga 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 Bachas kids who are seeing this telescope. Staying this, yeah. this is not a telescope. This is a kaleidoscope. Kaleidoscope. I was about to say. Yeah. Yeah. And and. They are having fun. This is a way of uh, so basically this kaleidoscope is what they're saying that as a mainlander, as these artists go to northeast, we already have a kaleidoscopic vision of of what they are. So yeah, maybe we do not understand them. 
So yeah. this is how the artist interpreted it. Like looking at a kaleidoscope, it was not a kaleidoscope, but actually, I'm sorry, not a telescope where you actually see it in detail. Yeah. But we have so much of news from North East, which are very biased in nature, and and we have typecast things, right? Yeah, stereotype them. So this is the work. So about. you you feel you said people were welcoming. You had volunteers from different places. Yeah. The fact that you were doing. Public art installations that were non-threatening in nature, which yeah. allowed people to interact, uh, that kind of helped the process of people. Experience. Yeah. Also, the Nada government was part of this, uh, so they were partnering us. And yeah. Tejan Bhai, who is a very important person, and he's one of the cultural uh, connoisseur, that one of the big uh, cultural guys who wants art and culture to happen, and he was my partner in that that thing. So, so he was. So, so they were helping the process. Yeah. And, yeah, and and yes, we also I also had a co-curator who was from Nagaland. So okay, so all these uh, uh, all these uh, things mattered. Otherwise, I was no one there, right? So but every uh, time you just but just building on that, every time you're working in a, like a separate space, public art work, and you're exploring somebody else's you know traditions and behaviors and patterns and culture, and you're doing it, how do you? How do you push your artists or the people that you're curating to go that extra mile to really delve deep into that community's, you know, background so that they represent it well? Yeah. How do you how do you do that? Yeah, for me, as I'm saying, this project also I have to spend like a one year there. One year is nothing, uh, but right. but then you, you collect a lot of literature. My co-curator was was from Netherlands, so he helped me a lot with the Naga literature. He told me about the Anga means who were. Uh, who are basically the main tribe in uh, Kohima, but right. uh, but so so my my literature, my academic share was taken care of by my co curator. Where I will not get wrong, right? Because right. I might be wrong in, in 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 this thing, but they understand. Like very interesting uh, uh, story I have to tell you on this is, uh, I found plenty of spots, right, where where works could be placed, but they didn't. But I could not negotiate. It's not about the language, because in in this city of Kohima also there are many villages, and these right. villages are having a headman, the head right. of the village. Mm-hmm. So the conversation with the headman will always be done by the co-curator or some or, or the Hija who's who's my cut of the head here. So mm-hmm. so this is very important. I I might be disrespectful towards him. So right. I was not even allowed to go close to that that context. So. Right. This was very important. So this is a work again. I'm just I'm just being uh, quick <laughs> about this. So this is a work by this uh, London-based artist now, Tenso Angar Long Kumar, very important Naga artist. And you see, there's this little kid's feet you see, and the work is basically a video projection of a shadow of a cognac dance. Cognacs are one tribe from the north. So right. what he had done is he did this. This is an interactive work, and you see shadows of people, and you you just have to stand on it and follow it. Right. And the projection is coming on from top, so it becomes like an interactive dance. It's not a difficult one. You just have to go with the flow of the feet. Right. So so you become part of. So so there's this young Naga girl's feet you see, who's trying to engage with this interaction. Right. So. Uh, on the right hand side now you see a a graffiti it's called tagging where you write names so this is the first time this is the artist the mizo artist i got and this was the first tagging which happened in nagaland okay so, so tagging was not there before that so after that there's lot of, there, there were some you know street art graffiti and all that but no tagging before that so he came and he's from uh, he's based in delhi but he's a mizo artist so he right. went there and he was doing this uh, I just quickly shift to another work, and this is a very interesting work, where uh, this artist is—you you, just—you don't see the work. This is a sound installation, and w- this work was uh, put in the uh, bus stand of uh, Kohima. Right. And this work was basically a lot of. Uh, so, so this artist Ruth is a Swiss artist, and she went to shoot bird sounds, birds. And voices of birds in a in a remote island in Canada. She got hours and hours of footage. So okay. when when she, she put this work in a train a uh, metro station in Basel, okay. Uh, and and we put it up in a 
uh, a station, a bus stop in Kohima. Now this work, when I'm I'm from the city, right? So when yeah. I hear the sound, it is like this grueling industrial noise. Yeah. But the work was put in Nagaland because it, in this Kohima Bazaar, because during Hornbill, a lot of people come from the villages, and yeah. their ears are tuned to sound, unlike us from the city. Yeah. So they yeah. identify certain bird sounds from others. For us, we might be incapable, incapable of that sound. We, yeah. For us, it's noise. But for them, a lot of people could identify certain bird sounds from there. Right. So, so I mean, it's, so it was like yeah. it was a combination of working with locals and working with uh, yeah. So that's how you pushed your art is that you really yeah. need it to, and even even the installation that you just talked about, even though it was shot somewhere elsewhere. Recorded somewhere elsewhere. Yeah, it kind of made sense because it fit in with the tradition Absolutely. of uh, the people coming from a certain place. Now, so just, now uh, Shaitan, yeah. just in the interest of time, I'm just going to move on with one more question that I had. Yeah, you're someone who's worked on a lot of public art festivals where bamboo has been the big piece of your production. Yeah, yeah. Is, is it because of Northeast? That's where the love of bamboo came, or as the material? Bamboo itself lent itself to your, you know, artistic uh, designs. How did that love affair start? Yeah, that love affair started from school, actually, from college. And I know at times when we would have festivals in colleges and stuff, uh, those days we used to create our own stage as an architect and designer. Those days, you know, we would make our own stage backdrops and all those things. So we started working with bamboo from a very early stage in life, you know from the college itself and uh, for me it was a very fascinating material so that extent yeah. that's one the reason why I kept on using bamboo again and again I also do a lot of bamboo installations myself you know uh, yeah I have that sort of designs which you know of of course both yeah. are all about bamboo yeah so so another another work I need to discuss uh, this is Jiva Galutra's installation yeah. called Neo Monster basically this is a life-size golden colored balloon of a jcb tractor mm -hmm. but it's a, it is a balloon okay and this balloon uh, i saw first in select city mall in delhi and those days uh, this was 2008 2009 when she put this work up inside the select city mall which you of course know as one of the biggest malls in yeah. delhi so yeah. here this work, work when it was put up it was slightly eerie because uh, those days a lot of demolition was happening in delhi for the no. illegal demolition and stuff so people were not very really, uh, happy or uh, happy with this structure because it being a JCB tractor because JCB tractor was the epitome of breakage and, and destruction yeah, of yeah. property yeah now this work was also about for her this work was also about destruction of forests so that's why this you see this uh, this projection on, on on the front which is basically destruction of forests yeah but when I relocated this work in Kohi in Isama Mm -hmm. This village, this was the stunner. The entire Nagaland like came like bees coming to a beehive. And okay. I was wondering how change of context can completely change a body of work also. So here, it is not a, a not a destructive model. Here, it's a lifesaver because this is a landslide prone area and JCB traveled the previous three years. How, you know, how meanings can change side like that. So this They're is where yeah. I was unaware as a curator. The artist was unaware as of this thing. How yeah. how change can happen, you know, how how you know things can change just by re re the contextualizing in yeah. that way. Uh, so yeah. So this is like a happy, happy uh, ending to like this could have this could have been something that's that dreadfully wrong because you misread it. But it was a very happy uh yeah, yeah. But Charles, no, this, is, this is not about, that's what I'm saying, this is all about experimentation. I yeah, am not yeah. considering that I know it. I'm saying I do not know it. And yeah. I'm trying to understand, I'm trying to instigate, uh, I'm trying to learn. And this is how public art works also. It is not, if I knew, it to go, yeah, then I don't know uh, anything, right? I don't even have to put the work if I'm clear about this thing. So for yeah. me, it is about how, uh, if you put something, how people will react around it. And this yeah. will probably take an anthropologist and many other things. Sociologist. That's the record, document, but yeah. that, that's not possible for us because we do, you know, out of our pockets and stuff. And 
all the friends I have always worked with for these festivals are for free. They work for free, you know. So this also a challenge, you know, just just pushing them to come and work for us for free. Yeah, because yeah. otherwise, who's funding these projects? No one does, no. Yeah, I mean, this is difficult. Even you know, the normal funding agencies shy away from coming and investing in in this kind of public I mean, idea. Yeah. Do it in a Kolkata or a Delhi. Much easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I like. I know you've put no man's land and no discussion with you would be complete without discussing this project. And I've obviously seen it in the past, but I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Tell us more about no man's land. Yeah, so this, this project. Yeah, this is a this is what I'm and sorry, Shahid, I just want to tell yeah. you this is how Jagannath introduced you to me for the first time. Like uh, you have to hear about the Bangladesh project, and uh, this is uh, this is the project that he was talking about. So, so go for it. So basically, as I told you before, that uh, in this invisible border called Rangpo, uh, my friend uh, uh, my Babu Rahman was stuck. He was never allowed to walk into Sikkim. Yeah. So we decided on one day that, you know, one day we will cross the border without a visa and passport. Of course, legally, not illegally. Right. So when I mean by legally, it took me four years from that day, I used to get back there. So first we had to find a site. Where would that site be? And uh, so every time we will do a joint recce to a Bangladesh artist team, we'll go there, I'll go from this side. So we kind of figured out a place uh, in Meghalaya, which is you all know about uh, uh, Shillong, and then uh, yeah. you know about Cherrapunji uh, uh, and Boston. Cherrapunji is the top, and then you go down again. And while you go down, there are these places called Shela and Bola Ganj. Again, these are plain lands. And what we are doing is the, this is very fascinating story because. Uh, these are called tribal lands. Once you were crossing a uh, Cherapunji and all that, and uh, what we're doing is Cherapunji is this hill which which became hills like a uh, crores of years back. You think put to one uh, this thing. So there's this vertical landmass which just walked up, it went up like a hill, and all of Bangladesh is like flat plains. Yeah. This this uh, Cherapunji hills we are breaking down these hills and. Uh, converting this uh, very high-grade limestone into cement. Okay. Now, all these border areas, what they're doing is they are comp- they these hills belong to the locals, so they do not know what they're selling. Right. They're, they're thinking they're selling the hill, but they're doing a huge destruction to uh, a huge environmental destruction. And yeah. for a hundred years plus, there is this cement factory on the other side. In, there's many cement factories in India on this area. Yeah. But there's also cement factories in Bangladesh. Yeah. So basically, uh, there is uh, one cement factory called Chatak, which is basically almost uh, six, uh, 11 or 12 kilometers by a conveyor belt from India to this thing. So we break yeah. this limestone, we break these hills, make them into boulders, and send them across to Bangladesh. Right. So, uh, one second. Yeah, so we send them across to Bangladesh and uh, we do it through three ways. We do it through, we do it through, uh, is my screen visible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. So th- you see, this is how after, uh, after, uh, after land blasting, after land, uh, you know, bombs are placed, uh, the yeah, dynamite, dynamite. Is, yeah. Uh, so after that, these uh, hills are broken, and then uh, humanly they do these things. And uh, what happens is uh, these are carried through this, as I said, this one uh, conveyor belt all the way into Bangladesh. Bangladesh. There's also riverways, and there's waterways. Sorry, riverways and roadways. Road so waste. these are the three options of con- pushing these hills to the flatland. Right, and this is uh, this was a point of entry. So because there was transaction happening, this is where we felt was where we need to work. We cannot work in a border where there's no one, right? Then kya point yeah. kya? Point we yeah. wanted to work in a border where there was some kind of transaction happening. And yeah. you see now here, trucks are coming in and going out, and the trucks are going to go into the no man's land. Uh, 
very interestingly, like India and Pakistan, there are two fences. There are mm. two fences. One the Bangladesh side, sorry, one in the Pakistani side and one in the Indian side. So there will be a, uh, and in the center will be this uh, stone. Oh, that's that. Your international borderline. Right. So this is in the case of Pakistan and India. But in the case of India and Bangladesh, Bangladesh doesn't have a fence. So what the Indians have done is from the international fence, we have taken around 200 feet inside our land and we have created a fencing. And it is like a almost like a 4,000 kilometer fence from Mizoram to onwards to uh, Bengal. Now, of course, there's many rivers, so you cannot have the fences. You know, these, these, these trucks are walking into the no man's land. So right. for me, my take for four years where I kept on getting rejected that no, of course, you cannot walk into Bangladesh. My saying was, I'm not going to go to Bangladesh. I, you have to let me go to the international fence. Mm. That means you have to allow me into this 200 feet because we're we're feet. Indian land. Right. this is Indian land. So whenever I have to go, the army would say, if the civil forces give you permission, we will give you. I go to civil, then they say, if the raw gives you permission, then you'll do. So if they were like, I was like a football and they were like keep playing all over. So this is a mazar in the middle of no man's land. So this people go and visit, right? So, so, so this was my take, you know, so you have to allow me. I'm not going into walking into Bangladesh, but you can let me go to the no man's land. Sure. So I collected, uh, I invited artists who work in Northeast, who are mostly not uh, artists from Northeast, so from Assam, from Meghalaya, uh, and one Australian artist who'd done a wonderful film on uh, on uh, so so we were working on the select side. You see that guy who was pointing it was they are really talking about that space. So for me, this this work is a very powerful work. Uh, is by a, a Bangladeshi artist, and she's actually facing the Indian border check post. So the guns are actually pointing at her and she's raised a white flag. A white flag means peace. And she was standing there for five hours. It was a performative artwork. We call it performance art. So her performance was holding a flag for five hours, a durational performance where an and opposite side where the photograph is taken from is basically, so they could also see her from their binoculars and, and say it uh, pointing very very strong work. This is Yasmin Jahan Nupo, she's currently showing in MoMA. Uh, she's from Bangladesh. This is Shimul's work where, you no, know, she's made a camera. This is a basically a, in front of his lens, he has made two windows and he wants to see what he wants to see through his own lens. And this work was installed like on the Indian side no, this was this was this work was installed in the no man's land, right? In the no man's land. I'm showing you the work. Bangladeshi works right now as right. right now. So all of them are in the no man's land. These are all no man's land, exactly. This is a massive work. This work is like almost two story, three story high. And this is made with cloth and it says amity. Amity means peace. Again, this is what they were talking about, right? So uh now this is now, when I was curating this work, I was kind of skeptical. What what would the Bangladeshi artist do? What would the Indian artist doing? But it ended up that most of the artists were working with this neighbor. The neighbor right. on on the site is, is was very important. So as I said, we worked in a very important crucial zone because transaction was happening on both sides, right? Yeah, yeah, through limestone. So because of that, all the all the locals were there and. Uh, and they were doing work. So I, I'll tell you of this work. I've shown you this work actually. Very important work. So again, you see, you can see the, the work of, of uh, artist. So this, this artist, uh, Sohail, he's standing there and just waiting. So there's so much of dust uh up through the limestone crushing right that you turn white in a in one hour's time right so so these are different works which happen there and you know so different things which different artists are saying i'm not telling you this is Bunem Wasif's work beautiful work work with 
photography. But now I want to show you one work. I'm sorry, we ran out of time. So, no, no, this is the waterway. This is the waterway. And uh, this is the Bangladeshi artists are traveling from, uh, they're on the way basically. We cannot cross, neither that they can, but they're on the water, which is again no man's land. And and uh, on the far end is India. Right. So this is me waving at them from the other side. We're trying to connect. So the so the finally what happened was the this BSF standing and and we are now at the no man's land finally after seven days. This is a work app. Can you see India and Pakistan? Yeah, and the, yeah. It's called a T, T pillar. Now this is a very important work by that same artist I was talking about, Nabuwood Rahman, my co-curator in this work. He is Bangladeshi. So the India and this is the international border, and this work, what he does is, so there is this triangular stones. In one yeah. side it's written India, the other side is Bangladesh, and these are T pillars. So no one has bothered to change. When India Pakistan. India, Pakistan to India Bangladesh B A N. Okay. Now this artist, and this is very highly political work. What you see is he tied his feet on this. Now he invites us to come and open him up. You see the border? That's India on the other side. Right. So we are all coming here. And you see that BSF guy is also watching. This BSF, there's all, they're always, and they're constantly wanting feedback. What is happening? What is happening? Because this never happened in front of them. No? Yeah. You're like, Unbelievable, this thing. So we are all opening it up, and what he does now, after we open this, he ties his face around it. So he just walks up. He gets up. He gets up. Sorry, this this is not there. But what he does is ties his face there. Right. So the idea is, you know, the stamp of Pakistan is still not gone from there. For it. Right. Right. Very strong work. And this was an instant performance. This is another performance by an Indian artist there so he was talking about how people get displaced and he was singing a very emotional performance actually uh -huh. so to do all these performances in nomads land you must have had to work quite a lot with the authorities on both sides yeah you can see the army but yeah that's what four years so yeah. i'm talking of, of permissions of four years yeah and coordinating so, with both sides and yeah. with uh mr rahman yeah, yeah, of course. This intense, uh, this thing. So this is the work by um, Shishin. So he used that limestone and used bioblades, and we made these sculptures out of it. So related. This is a work. Uh, yeah. So uh, we're just kind of coming towards the end. Actually, yeah. I kind of overshot a little bit. And I know a thank you for everyone who's had the patience to stay along uh, with this. I went, I think it must have been amazing because you saw so many amazing pieces of work by Shantan. So Shantan, you've done a lot of these public art festivals. You've explored new areas, places that are, that were alien to you in the beginning, but became much closer to your art as a result of your work. What's next on the agenda? What's where, Where's the journey taking you next? What's the big See, thing that's keeping you occupied? Uh, a lot of work is uh, about, uh, these are ongoing work, so none of these have closed down Anyway, so right now, I mean, the, the next ongoing work of No Man's Land is, you must have heard about these pieces called enclaves. Enclaves were, and they, they used to be there. So there was these pockets of India inside Bangladesh. Like there were right. like 100 of them. And vice versa, so there were like 50, 100 pockets of Bangladesh inside India. They got dissolved in 2015. And uh, so, dissolved, so what all the Bangladeshis who were inside, they were given a choice, you want to go to Bangladesh or you want to join India. So right. all the Bangladeshi pockets inside India, they joined India. So they became yeah. Indian citizens. So mm -hmm. they have got their own voter card, ID card. Similarly, when the Indian uh, people inside Bangladesh were given that choice, around 760 people, they decided, no, let's go back to India. Okay. And so, so the rest, 10,000 people or so, or maybe more, they decided we we'll, we'll, we'll make joining Bangladesh. Right. So they became Bangladeshis, but these around 750, 760 people, they thought, you know, I will go back to India. 
Okay. Yeah, there was never that case. They were, they were, these were pockets of India inside Bangladesh. Inside Bangladesh, yes. Now we have become the new refugees of the nation. And uh, it's, it's a very complex story. And we are, uh, we are now archiving their work through artists. So we're not archiving through, as anthropologists, as historians, but we want to know their story because these people for 70 years were stateless. Right. We hear a lot about statelessness now. So these people were stateless. So we need to learn how they survived those 70 mm-hmm. years without the nation state. And this right. work, what we are doing is we are trying to understand from them as artists how they survived. So this is right. It's a very interesting body of work which we keep on continuing and going to places that doing. Amazing. So thanks so much, Chandan, um, for joining us and giving us a brief look. A very, I mean, this can continue for hours. Yeah. It can continue for hours. But giving us a brief look at this fantastic journey from starting off as a trained architect to getting uh, fascinated and uh, attracted towards the world of art in coach, in contemporary art, your travels in Northeast, the public art festivals that you've built, the really challenging work in no man's land where you push the boundaries of understanding what it means to be part of a state and what this means to be stateless. And more importantly, what it means to be human, I suppose, in, yeah. in your journeys. So, uh, and, and I think the biggest lesson I can draw is that you know, you're always pushing the boundaries of ambiguity uncertainty to kind of get to these stories and show it as an artist so thank you so much and that's a lesson i guess we all learn from you thanks so much for part of beats uh art design conversation series and listening to um and just joining us in this uh, i'd like to open it to the audience if anyone has a couple of questions for which we have time to uh ask shantan while we while we have him with us I'm sure uh, some of his stories must have ignited some questions. Deep, if I may. Please, please. Hi, Sukhan. Yeah, yeah. Shantanda, if you remember, when the first lot of bamboo came into Guajara, the kind of questions we had, the you also might remember the whole, you know, the, the teams that were working with us, they kept saying, Bamsa and Ngi Pakijudi, Bamsa, including the minister, they had no clue. And we saw it, we saw the transformation happening. The point where people sought to keep the Gwajara installation and all the lovely little seat, seating kind of bamboo arrangements that you had made along the trail and they were there for a pretty long time. Yes. So we saw the change happen right in front of us through the, uh, the period of the Bhubaneswar art trail. Now my question to you is, did that uh, validate your idea of putting up those particular pieces along the entire... That's something I've been wanting to ask you. No, no, I was, I was very, uh, of course, uh, as uh, the, my first, so uh, connect my first journey to Bhuvaneshwar with Premjish and Jagannath was that one extremely flooded day in yeah. Bhuvaneshwar city. And yeah. uh, we were in knee deep water. And that idea itself transformed my notion of Bhuvaneshwar. That, uh, it gave me that feeling that in spite of the fact that it is so much inside the land and how uh, climate change is uh, happening and uh, you, you talk about bamboo that reinforced my vision of bamboo again uh, to work with bamboo there more uh, because that my first visit was this walking through water so these roads have transformed into river lines that time and we're walking through that trail right so and I, I, I presently that was part of my work to see the future of cities. So even even the cities which we planned or not so uh, designed planningly, but we're not looking at that future of 50 years or whatever. So so for me, the work was about future. To look at a, a kind of a heterotopia, a kind of a dystopia, that this this could be the future of, of, of uh, our, our cities. So 
I identified Bhuvaneshwar like that, you know, that but we will be drowning soon because we have not created proper drainage systems and and many other things. In spite of there's so much of greatery around, but again, uh, as marker, so for instance, that that seating we designed uh, opposite that school was very important because that was my reaction. I felt that this is very important because people are standing there, so they should enjoy. They should become part of that space. So several things were done. Uh, not only for the festival for thinking for a longer term, but of course we uh, use temporary materials. We design them in temporary ways. Uh, we didn't have a choice, you know. But this was an attempt. It was also an attempt for other designers to come in later to work on their spaces, to show them the possibility that how very simple designs can change things. We are so glad that answers were good. You know, for me as a person who works with communities. It was very, uh, it was very interesting to see how people started owning them, and you know, a few months after, when Dick was trying to get the installations, uh, you know, maintained, save in other places, there were actually little quarrels among the people of Bhojar of as to no, no, this car you can't remove, no, this has to stay, until it kind of uh, collapsed in the cyclone. But like you said, uh, climate emergency. Today I was reading an article. Bhuvneshwar is sitting at 41, 42 degrees. Yeah. Uh, in in mid-April, they we blast 10,000 trees in one year. Yeah. Just one. 10,000 trees have been cut down from the middle of the city. And to go back to the 70s, Bhuvneshwar was a city of temperate, uh, moderate temperatures, and we used to come in from other parts of the world to. Kind of have a summer vacation scene, so somewhere even that is not reflected, getting reflected. It, it is terrible. It is unbearably hot. I mean, I think that heat wave is all across India right now, but it's in your face. My emergency is in your face. You're living it. Now. Yeah, so Kanya. Also, also one more thing is what what again coming back to where Sandeep started was he asked me why I I did not do architecture. So. These are things we resolution me from the beginning that we are making these concrete structures without thinking. Mm-hmm. Architects are also encouraging in that we do not create spaces. We are just always, you know, going by the demands of the client or whoever they are, and we are just doing wall to wall through the, not even leaving an inch of land for as open spaces and stuff. So now these are all backfiring at us. So maybe I, I decided. Long time back, but uh, I mean, trained as an architect, I will I'll probably uh, not do this. But rather, I will talk again space from of of, of insane of, uh, buildings and whatever. There, yeah. we just I mean, we need to talk as as architects. I'm better to talk than a non-architect of of on construct. Brilliant. Any other questions, guys? Thank you yes. very much. Oh, thank you, Beats. One last question, if anybody has it. Going, going one, going two, going in God. Shantan, thank you so much for coming today. It was amazing, and uh, we we hope to uh, work with you at some point of time when you have the chance to visit us in Bhubaneswar. And our beads would love to participate in some of these. Amazing festivals, amazing conversation journeys that you are participating with, and I would like to thank the entire audience to come who come today to listen to this. We'll also be continuing this series, and most probably, who's the next person we are inviting? Uh, I think Smita, when I was a very uh, talented uh, young uh, artist who's coming up with a very different kind of project. So we continue these explorations uh, month on month, and hope to see you all there. Thank you, Shantan, once again, and thanks everyone. Thanks, thanks guys. Thank thanks everyone. Thank Come back soon. Yes. <laughs> Looking forward. All right, guys. Thank you. Bye bye.